Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. The HBO series, The Gilded Age, details the lives of New York City's antique ultra-rich without giving much thought to the rest of the city. Joining us today to talk about what lies under NYC is archeologist and triple CUNY alumna, Alyssa Loria, CEO of Chrysalis Archeological Consultants. Alyssa, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. A lot of our ideas of what an archeologist does come straight out of Indiana Jones. Our cultural impression is that archeologists dig up priceless treasure, but when you dig under New York, what are you finding there? Garbage. Um, one man's trash is another man's treasure, and uh, that's what you're really going to learn from. Anytime I'll go into a school, I'll challenge the kids. It's like, hey, if I went through your garbage at home, do you think I could learn a bit about you? And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, yeah. And I mean, a lot of it is, you know, what gets left behind, what gets left behind beneath the ground surface. You might occasionally find something that is considered priceless, but my version of priceless is in terms of what it can teach you about someone who did not make it into the history books. In the Gilded Age, New York City of the late 1800s sure does look shiny and clean and full of exquisitely dressed people building astonishing mansions uptown. But when Luria and Chrysalis literally dug into downtown, they found a very different way of living. So what is an almshouse and where was ours? An almshouse is essentially a poor house. Um, it is a place for the poor to essentially go and be rehabilitated by society or for society. And um, our first almshouse in New York is where City Hall stands today. Uh, there's a certain irony in that when you think about it. Poor houses, almshouses, um, charitable municipal charitable relief in New York City has been ongoing for centuries, um, beginning in 1736. First of all, I don't understand how people were rehabilitated from their poverty. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a huge difference between being rehabilitated by society and being rehabilitated for society. Yes, it's very different than we think of life today. Uh, there were numerous reasons why someone would end up in an almshouse. You could be a widow or an orphan who could not afford to pay their way. You could be mentally insane. Poor houses were only for the deserving poor um, because charity only goes to those who deserve it. Uh, it. It's a harsh system, and the system continues to be harsh well through the 18th, the 19th century, even through today. Uh, homelessness and poverty remain a timeless problem for urban centers. In the Gilded Age, the fiction and the time period, the uptown children of the very rich struggle to find the perfect combination of love and money in their marriages. Poor children living near Wall Street had a more terrifying overlap to deal with. What did you discover about the proximity of the almshouse to the prison? It's kind of disturbing from my modern sensibility that you are housing women, children, the poor, in this poor house and your provided tasks, you know, you have to work to earn your keep, so to speak. But on either side of them are prisons. And at times the population, they were so overcrowded that the populations would mingle. And that's a very rough concept to digest. Um, but, you know, we've come a long way uh, in when you think about it. But, you know, even like the period of the Gilded Age, uh, not unlike today, 10% of New York City's population has the majority of the wealth. Mm -hmm. And everybody else is just working, whether you are on the lower rungs of the economically disadvantaged to a working middle class. And how that is going to affect you really plays out in terms of what resources are available. But when you go back to the historic period, I think one of the most um, telling or in a sense kind of upsetting was finding a child's plate within the walls of a prison. And, you know, finding references in historic documents that children as young as 12 were being convicted of stealing bread because they were hungry. In the Gilded Age, George Russell, played by Morgan Spector, is a dead ringer for Jay Gould. We watch him as he builds extraordinary wealth from railroads. But historically, a lot of New York's money comes from water. In New York City in the 1800s, what was the relationship between water and power? Water is very interesting for New York because we have so many aspects of reliance on it, from 
the founding of being a trading port, being you know the mouth of the harbor, the connection to the old world. New York City's money is built off of our relationship, or not so much our relationship, but our access to the water. New York City was a shipping town. Large homes in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn were built because they were built by shipping magnets. And water is the basis of being able to do that mercantilism, that trade, which enabled people to develop vast amounts of wealth. And not to mention the triangle trade as well, which went from Africa to the Caribbean to the New World, importing goods and slaves. And there were many families that made quite a lot of money through the slave trade. Yeah, I live in Bedford-Stuyvesant. There are stickers all over about Peter Stuyvesant as a slave trader. Many of the families, you'd be hard pressed to go back through New York City's history and uh, identify some of the early founding families and the wealthiest families that did not have some connection or you know, have enslaved labor in their household. Right now in New York City, our water comes from 19 reservoirs and three lakes spread across the Hudson Valley and the Catskill Mountains. But in the Gilded Age and before, there was no way we could pipe water that far. So what do they do? In their seaport dig, Loria and Chrysalis Archaeology found some very interesting water-moving artifacts. Well, this is my favorite because the thought of water moving through wooden water pipes seems really inefficient, <laughs> first of all. Um, but, you know, early on, you well water. You have to dig into the ground to get your water, but you can't drink it because it's brackish. We're an island. But when you did get to that well water at the center point of the island, how are you then going to get it all those blocks over to the houses? And, you know, some people had the fabulous idea to have wooden water pipes, which it was a fascinating system, seems highly ineffective. And people complained about it nonstop. You pulled this out of the ground. How did you identify what it was? That's always one of the hardest questions for me. People are like, how do you know what that is? And, you know, part of me just wants to say, I, I don't know. I just know I've been doing this for so long. You, you kind of just get that sense. Um, you know, it's not normal to just find a hollowed out log just right there in the middle. But we did find pieces that were connected together. So you could see the connections. Connected by what? Uh, no, literally two wooden pipes, one end carved, fitted into another. And it's Wow. just flowing in like a metal collar around it. Wow. doesn't seem the most efficient system. Um, people paid approximately $5 a year to have running water in their house. But if you couldn't drink the well water where you were living, I'm, I guess it seems like a pretty good deal. I may go home and kiss my plumber. I think we take for granted the fact that we can um, open up the faucet and have some of the best drinking water in the country. <laughs> in that seaport dig, what did you discover about individual New Yorkers' relationships to water? So, all right, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, probably still one of my favorite all-time artifacts that I've ever found is a stoneware bottle, but when we started to research the seal that was on the bottle, we discovered that it was mineral water imported from Germany that dated to 1790. And I, I'm sorry, just the mere thought of people importing water from Europe in 1790 was like, okay, yeah, okay, only in New York. Uh, and it was, but if you know what, if you were wealthy, you could do that. And mineral waters would be imported for multiple reasons. One, if you were wealthy and you don't want to drink the, the groundwater because, let's face it, it was only good for tea and making beer. Why not? Um, and, let, you know, we love bottled water today, but apparently we loved it back then, too. And how did the business of water become J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Oh, because they really wanted to be banking to begin with. Water was just an easy excuse or a little back door to get into the banking business. Um, and basically, the way the regulations were at the time, um, anything, once they raised the funds, any monies that were not spent on the expenditure of the water industry or the water business with water delivery company, the Manhattan Water Company, they could use for investment. So they spent as little as possible. They used the cheapest materials possible, wood. And uh, there you go. It really is. The more yeah, things change, door. the more they... The business of New York is business. The business, yes. Yeah. Yes, always was. Yeah.
I lived on Beekman and Pearl for about 10 years in the 1990s. And even then, it felt like the area was and had always been 100% commercial, like people never really lived at the seaport. Is that true? Not true. So pretty much up until like the mid late 19th century, home and workplace were pretty much joined together. It's really not until you know you start getting toward the industrial revolution that you have a separation of home and workplace. You have people going to factories and industry to work. So back at the beginning when it was a lot of merchants and bars, taverns, the seaport area was both residential and commercial. And it's later in the 19th century that it makes that shift to totally commercial. Growing up in the city, I remember the Fulton Fish Market. I remember the smell of the Fulton Fish Market. Um, but then post 9-11, again, it's kind of come back full circle and you have both residential and commercial in there. Um, th there's some nice things that are very cyclical about the history of lower Manhattan. <laughs> the guys coming out, if you, if you got up early, you'd see the guys walking out, out with their big fish hooks. Yeah. From the seaport. Yeah. And even, you know, parts of Brooklyn, like growing up, I remember walking in areas living down by the water where, you know, the boats would come in and you could go and just buy fresh fish to bring home. You know, it's just that was, you know, New York. I think it's kind of shifted a bit from that. Yeah. Um, and I, I will say my favorite water fun fact um, related to South Street Seaport and how the more, you know, kind of like cyclical nature during Hurricane Sandy when everything flooded, the water only went as far inland as the original high water line. Oh. <laughs> so it literally went right back to where it used to be. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. Wow. And when you dug into the seaport, what did you find out about the land that makes up the actual seaport? Again, garbage. You know, everyone's like, oh, wouldn't it be fun to have a time machine? And I'm like, the past must have been a very smelly place because garbage pickup is a relatively modern concept. It's maybe like a century, a century and a half old. Uh, so when people needed to throw their garbage out, you would either throw it in your backyard. Um, if you were no longer using a privy to go to the bathroom in, uh, you could throw your garbage out there or you had an assigned day of the week where you could go dump your garbage into the water of the East River to create landfill. To create the actual land itself that extends out on the East River. Yeah. The city used to have, um, they used to offer water grant, water lot grants. Mm -hmm. So someone who was living on the water, they had um, title to the lot of water. And part of their job was to build it up and to fill it to knowingly create land. So Water Street was called Water Street because the water was there. Not anymore. Not anymore. Um, All of that from Water Street to the water? Pretty is... much Pearl Street to the water. Objects in the Gilded Age, white gloves, gold card cases, have significant power both as status symbols and personal attachments. Unlike the Gilded Age, we live in a society where objects are highly disposable, but not always biodegradable. Will our trash someday be an archaeologist's treasure? I think you're going to have to look at it a little differently um, in the future, largely because trash used to be thrown out in your backyard. It was very localized. So when you're looking at a property and you're finding a privy or a cistern where they dumped all their garbage, you're relating it back. You know who you can find who lived there, but now everything gets carted off. Um, not only that, our garbage gets carted out of New York City. So I think you will be able to learn about society and culture from a perspective, but who are the people and what aspect of those people are you going to you know learn about? Um, but then again, what does survive? What isn't going to survive? Like I'm pretty sure you know Pampers are going to be sticking around um, and Twinkies, but. <laughs> Well, what does it feel like to, to dig up and then handle these personal items? Um, I'm going to say a lot like a kid on Christmas sometimes. Uh, it, it's, you spend a lot of time finding nothing in archaeology, uh, which is kind of like the myth, oh, you're always finding things. And it's like, no, you find a lot of nothing, which is a learning experience unto itself. But Indiana Jones is always finding something. He always finds something. <laughs> He's the luckiest archaeologist out there. Uh, but 
It's interesting because, well, one, we're not finding anything as flashy as indie, but you know, you're finding objects that meant something to somebody or didn't necessarily mean something because it got thrown out for whatever reason. But it makes history personal. Mm. It makes it more about the real people. And there, the interesting thing about historical archaeology is it's very relatable. The forms haven't changed all that much. Um, plates are plates. A fork is a fork. But when you have like a child's toy, and you can kind of imagine like, you know, that child playing with that toy, it makes everyday people real. And, you know, as I've said, probably less than 5% of society makes it into the history books. And that is a misrepresentation of what it means or is necessary to run society. Historical romances like The Gilded Age showcase time periods with extreme prohibitions against sex. The stories we tell about that age can sometimes make it seem like everyone was buttoned up and not getting any. But the trash dug in under New York City tells a very different story. What interesting device did you find underneath our fair city? <laughs> well, you must be referring to the device or the artifact that went viral. Um, if something can go viral in archaeology, um, the bone object we found <laughs> in a very large trash deposit in City Hall Park would be it. Um, an internal irrigator, um, more commonly known as a douche, um, was found and it did indeed go viral because I was randomly getting phone calls one morning. It's like, um, that artifact you found? I think it was on Saturday Night Live. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Um, you know, historically, we knew that there had been a big celebration in City Hall Park, and we were very excited when we found a very large trash deposit that would indicate a large singular event. And there were, you know, all sorts of like beautiful pottery and animal bones and you know, alcohol bottles, they had a big party. And then there was this one little object. We're like, what is this thing? And it, it was just, you know, someone, uh, one of uh, the team happened to have been working at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia and stumbled across this. It was like, uh oh. And we're like, oh, it's a douche. Okay, so what was going on at that party? I think there is something, uh, aside from, of course, it being wonderfully salacious and fun, there's something about a personal item like that that really makes those people who can seem so, sometimes the past can seem really foreign. And it just yeah. makes them that they are us, you know, again, all over. They are, they're people. They, you know, everyday people living everyday lives, trying to survive, trying to have fun, um, whatever way, trying not to get pregnant, uh, you know, which is, Look. you know, likely the reality of that device. Um, archaeology does have that tendency to make history real. Um, and, you know, you can go, it's easy to learn about the wealthy in society, and you can find um, remnants of things that belong to them. They're in museums. But what about that everyday person, you know, or, you know, the downstairs people. What about the servants? Um, what about the people who just, you know, the school teachers, the, you know, the people who just, the construction workers, the people who just built New York? The majority of our guests' education, starting all the way back in her undergraduate years, happened here at CUNY. And I am embarrassed to say that I never thought of CUNY as a school for archaeology. <laughs> so how did I make that mistake? I think CUNY is so big, it's easy to make that mistake. I mean, you think about it, CUNY is probably the size of some state school systems. Um, and that's because, you know, let's be biased here. We're New York City. Um, but it is, it's, it's a, a vastly large community. Um, and it's a great community. I, I mean, I'm still in touch with uh, professors that I worked, you know, that I took classes, I worked with, um, now consult with, or now colleagues. So... Uh, and there's a little bit of everything at CUNY. Archaeology. Absolutely. And probably things even more obscure than that. <laughs> In the Gilded Age, the Astors think of themselves as the original old New York high society, but Dutch names like Van Cortlandt and a family called Bronx predated them by a century. What have you discovered about earlier European families living in New York? I think, like, 
many people feel, you know, or think about the United States, they think in terms of English and an English background. But New York City was very staunchly Dutch. And you had the majority of the early families, they're Dutch families. Um, one of the more prominent families were the Van Cortlands. Stephanus Van Cortland would be the first native-born mayor. They were a very um, wealthy family involved in the triangle trade. Their property in the Bronx is the closest thing that New York City had to an actual plantation, in the sense that we think of a plantation in the South. That is very much what the Van Cortland property was like here. A lot of these, like, old school families. Here, they have these, you know, Dutch backgrounds. But even like in the Gilded Age, you have the Van Rhines, which is, you know, a Dutch name. Um, so I think, you know, probably goes through phases in terms of making money and the new money. And now the new money is the old money. I mean, you know, if you look at the Vanderbilts, we will consider them old money nowadays. But once upon a time, they were the new money. The actual original New Yorkers are the Lenape. And in Brooklyn, the tribes were the Nyack and the Canarsie. Do you ever find artifacts predating the European settlers? Fortunately, I have. Uh, but it's rarer and rarer to do so. Uh, there's been so much development in New York. And archaeology has a wonderful way of still finding pockets to hide in, which is probably a funny way to look at it. But it, it's harder and harder to find Native American um, artifacts, largely because a lot of the areas they would have inhabited would have been closer to water resources. Um, uplands, and we've done a lot of cutting of our landscape and a lot of grading and filling in of our landscape. And did they not make as much trash? Well, they still made trash, but it was a different type of trash. I mean, they used stone tools. Um, you know, stone, stone has a wonderful way of lasting. It's not going to biodegrade. But a lot of the other materials, um, the materials they would use to build their huts and houses, that is going to readily degrade, and it's just shadows that are left. But if you have like a lithic work site, you're going to find that scatter of stone. Um, it's just it's harder and harder to find those in New York City. What's a lithic work site? So a lithic work site is essentially where they would make the stone tools, um, which is fascinating unto itself. It's you know called flint napping, where you just striking two rocks together and eventually striking away flake after flake until you have your arrowhead or your spear point. The world changes so fast, and that gets multiplied by a thousand when it comes to New York City. In New York, both the people and the government, are, are we generally devoted to maintaining historic sites? That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I think people are genuinely interested in New York City's history. But I think that uh, economics, development, the business of business outweighs that and overwhelms that. Um, it's a struggle to get some history landmarked um, or truly recognized. We live in a city where um, historic houses have to compete with international class museums. So that makes it difficult to kind of like shine. Um, whereas, you know, other areas in the country might put a focus on what they call heritage tourism, not as, you know, big a focus in New York City. So I think while there is a care, um, New York City is so big, it kind of, you know, falls through the cracks. I would be hard pressed to get uh, someone coming to visit me to say, hey, let's go look at the 1800s or the 1700s. Exactly. So, I mean, they might want to go see the Woolworth building, but they're not really going to want to go visit a, you know, historic farmhouse um, that yeah. might right. be a big thing somewhere else. But, but go to Massachusetts and everybody's exactly. heading to Sturbridge Village. So based on your understanding of historic debris, what is New York City? Oh, another loaded question. It is, New York City is vast yet small and exceedingly complex. Uh, you open up the city streets in some areas, and it's, you know, I once had an engineer describe it as looking like spaghetti soup, because there's so much infrastructure. And I never thought that being an archeologist in New York City would turn me into an infrastructure geek, but just how the city is built and constructed, constructed how it runs and operates is really fascinating. But New York City is just layer 
upon layer that gets peeled back and rebuilt on. Um, but more importantly, New York City is people. People are the key to New York City. And I think that's why people come here. Um, it's a certain character. And, you know, we inhabit this stage of skyscrapers and concrete. And, but it's really, um, I think it's important and interesting to think it's like, it was a small little trading post village. Uh, they had all these farms in the outer boroughs. Because uh, everyone thinks of just Manhattan being New York City. But we have, you live in Brooklyn, we have the outer boroughs um, where all the farms were. And, you know, I was like a little kid who thought my parents were lying to me when they told me that there were farms in Brooklyn and New York City. But, uh, so, and that's why it's complex. There are so many layers to New York City's history. And think about all the people who have come, um, so many different cultures and characters. Um, so yeah, that's New York to me. It's like a giant tossed salad of all this wonderful stuff. <laughs> Lisa, I'm so sorry we are out of time. It has been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful.